Welcome, Ray. Thanks for joining us. Okay, we've got lots of attendees signed in. And uh, so if you're, if you're not on our board of directors, we can't see you, we can't hear you. Um, if you have any questions along the way, uh, you would raise your digital hand. And during the presentation, I probably won't see your digital hand, but we'll have lots of time later for questions. Just to let you know, so if you're, if you're an attendee, you're not on the screen, you can eat your lunch, we can't hear you, your dogs are barking, don't worry about it. It's just our panelists, our board of directors, you can see right now, and I'm gonna introduce them and then we'll dive in. So we've got Joanne Waite, welcome Joanne. And uh, Ray Hansen's are on our board of directors as well. Welcome, Ray. And Sw Stan Swinarchuk as well. And uh, Roy Schieser, we can just see your forehead, Roy, but welcome. There we go. And uh, Ray Travers uh, helped us with a report. He was our content advisor. He's not on our board of directors, but he's gonna help with questions at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Ray. Nice to be uh, with you again. And so my name is Jennifer Houghton and I'm on the board of directors for the Boundary Forest Watershed Stewardship Society. And uh, uh, the boundary is in the traditional territory of the Sinaiks, the Tunaha, the Seelik, and the Okanagan Indian Band as well. So uh, I'm sorry if I uh, left anybody out, please inform me if I have um, mispronounced anything or left anybody out. So I'm going to dive right into the presentation. It's going to be about 40 minutes, and then we're going to have Q&A later. And I know that we've got some expert attendees, um, so uh, people who are ecologists and hydrologists. So later on, if we've got questions in those areas, I welcome your comments and um, your answers to those questions. So our report is called A Brighter Future for Boundary Forests, and that's why we've named this uh, our webinar this. Oh, and just to let you guys know, those of you who are attendees, um, normally on these webinars, there might be two or three people co-hosting, but today it's just me. So unfortunately, I won't see your questions and comments until the end. Um, if you do have to leave early, type a comment in the chat box and we'll get to it and you'll receive the answers to your questions in the recording. All right, so we are a nonprofit grassroots citizen society based in the boundary, advocating for culturally, ecologically, and economically sustainable nursery practices in the forest and watershed of the boundary area. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it later, but we've got a different definition of the word sustainable than the forest industry and the province of British Columbia has, and that's a, a key component to our brighter future proposal. This is a map of the Canadian portion of our watershed. And sometimes this area is called the Kettle River watershed. We're calling it the Boundary Watershed because it includes the Granby River as well. And um, it's an 8,000 square kilometer area north of the US border. And there's another 2,000 square kilometer area of our watershed south of the US border. So the people that contributed to our report, I've introduced a number of them already. Um, Ray Hansen's a, regist a retired registered forestry technician. Um, Wayne Tibloos, I hope you're signing on here. He was having some trouble signing on. Wayne Tibloos is also uh, on our board of directors. He's a, a retired logger. Stan is a retired logger. Uh, um, Roy has a background in ecology. Uh, Tony, who's not here, he's got a, he's a woodworker. And um, Ray Travers is a retired regist registered professional forester, and he was a great help as content advisor on our report. We got funding from Patagonia, and we also did some local fundraising drives. There are two parts to our report. They're both available on our website at boundaryforest.org. They're long reports, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this will interest you in, uh, in reading them. There's a lot more detail than what I'm going to cover today. I'm going to summarize the things that are in our report. Our main report um, addresses problems and solutions. What's wrong in the boundary forest, how the current forestry system is negatively impacting our watershed and the people in it, and we propose a brighter future for both. We also have a field report. Um, Stan and Wayne worked extensively on this. We traveled um, our watershed and we um, went to 12 different sites. We made observations, we took photos, we did uh, video, 
included analysis and recommendations. Both of those, again, are on our website. So this presentation, I'm going to be covering mostly the main report. I'm going to summarize our proposal and our goals, talking about the outdated forestry paradigm that currently exists in British Columbia, and talk about the new forestry paradigm that we want to see implemented, not only in our watershed, but across British Columbia. We'll talk about the impediments to our goals, the costs being imposed on the boundary by the current system, and most of all, and most importantly, talk about the new path forward. We need to talk about solutions at this point. People across BC are really upset with all of the problems that we're seeing happening. Um, so there are two fundamental questions that the information covered here will inform. Number one, what values do people of the boundary want sustained from their forests? Number two, once decided, what are the most effective forest practices to sustain those values? Those of us who are members of the um, Boundary Forest Society, we're citizens of the boundary. And this report represents what we want for our community and for the, um, the, the broader public interest here. Governments of all levels should represent values of citizens and work for the public interest, not for corporations and not for corporate profits. Corporate interests we've discovered are in direct conflict with the public interest, particularly here in the Boundary, where we've experienced a huge amount of catastrophic flooding. Land base we're addressing is public land. It's public land. Uh, the majority of the watershed here is public land and we're addressing the industrial scale clear-cut logging that's happening on it. It's quick and dirty. Um, our new path forward to sum it up, the long-term solution we're proposing is a shift to the new paradigm of true sustainability. We're going to define that in a moment and that will a manifest as nature-based forestry that's guided by community forest boards. More details later. This comparison chart is on our website and it's also in our report. I'm gonna go through it very quickly so that we compare forest management paradigm. So the current paradigm is industrial and the new paradigm that we're talking about is based in nature. It's based in ecosystems and it's based in community. The dominant value in the current system is timber supply. The dominant value in the new paradigm is ecological values. Uh, in other words, nature's needs. The policy influencer and the business model in the current um, system is private interests and large corporations. We want to aim for public interests and citizens' interests and focusing on small to medium-sized businesses having access to the timber supply. Uh, the market currently is monopolistic. We want an open, competitive market. The objectives of the current system are uninterrupted timber supply and corporate profits. We want to see a focus on ecological integrity and resilience and stable community economies. The current outcome and the products of the current system are a high volume of production. So some of you may have seen those huge chips of raw logs being shipped out of um, Vancouver harbors. Um, and dimension lumber is also one of the main products of the current system. We want to see high value products and value added products. Decision making is currently centralized. We want to see decentralized community based decision making. Planning method in the silviculture focus currently is timber volume based and it's about tree farms. We want to see planning based on nature's needs and community needs. We want to see biodiverse species and we want to conserve old and mature forests in our watershed. The logging method currently focuses on clear cutting and removing all the pieces. We want to see selection logging. I'm going to define that later because there's a little bit of um, uncertainty and confusion publicly. I see that um, questions on Facebook a lot about what selection logging mean. And selection logging, we're talking about the kind that's um, constrained by nature's limits. This outdated paradigm that's currently functioning in forest management in BC is unsustainable and it's highly flawed. The economic value of our forests is diminishing. The ecosystem integrity and resilience are diminishing. 
plant and animal species are facing local extinction. Ancient forests are being lost. Local people are being negatively impacted by forestry practices. I'm sure you've all heard of the catastrophic 2018 flood. We've had more flooding beyond that. We are losing our protection from climate change and jobs are in decline. So just exactly what is the corporate industrial forest industry trying to sustain? Well, it's dominated by large multinational corporations and it seeks to sustain profits. So what's being sustained is defined by the short term. It's defined by narrow politics rather than being oriented to the broad long-term public interest. So corporations are left to monitor themselves and make short-term profit their primary objective in the watershed. And the result is that all other benefits, ecological, economic, social, continue to weaken and deteriorate. So this is a picture of uh, clear-cut logging, a high elevation site, um, subalpine zone, and uh, this is no longer serving us. These trees here um, on this steep slope at this high elevation, uh, how likely are they to grow back in this climate of climate change? This is a problem. The new paradigm of true sustainability that we are proposing uh, means that the primary objective of forest management is to maintain the ecological integrity of the forest ecosystem. And this creates beneficial outcomes for humans. Truly sustainable forestry encompasses four essential elements. Number one, keeping and linking all the parts, both ecological and social. And when we clear cut, we're, we're wiping off all the parts on the surface. All the above ground parts are removed. And that affects the below ground parts as well. Number two, uh, we're talking about understanding nature's patterns and processes. So nature's timelines are important too rather than basing forest management decisions on um, political timelines or profit timelines, we're basing them on uh, the complete growth cycle of a forest stand, the complete growth cycle of a tree. Uh, we're using long-term planning horizons, 300, 500, 1,000 years from now, what are these forests gonna look like? Number four, public involvement to maintain community standards. That's really, really important across British Columbia, not just in our watershed. So rather than having a one size fits all kind of forest system imposed on everybody, we want people to be able to have a say in what's going on in their local forests. For a forest to be managed sustainably, the rate of recovery must be equal to or exceed the rate of depletion and or loss from clear cut logging and roads. So right now, they're taking more than they're putting back. And again, this is, you know, steep, high elevation for cut logging um, in an area that gets 15 feet of snow in the winter. It's got a short growing season. Um, how likely are these um, forests going to grow back the way that they were before they were clear cut? New paradigm of true sustainability, different outcomes include we're sustaining forestry jobs. It's just that those forestry jobs have different outcomes. We maintain ecological integrity. We allow the system to self-renew. In this case, we're going to have to do a lot of restoration to recreate systems that self-renew. Forest value has increased, and certainly it's not happening in our watershed where we walk around and we see 20-year-old clear cuts where nothing is growing, 13-year-old clear cuts where nothing is growing. Uh, the forest, oh, sorry, the um, social cohesion increases. So we're looking at less butting heads between loggers and environmentalists. A uh, life of security and meaning. We all want that. So what, uh, what's impeding our goals? Well, BC forestry legislation, it supports and sustains the outdated monopolistic corporate industrial paradigm that allows industry to, to monitor itself. This little excerpt here is from a 1979 document called uh, the Kettle River Valley Rural Study, and even back then people were lamenting uh, that how difficult it was for small and medium-sized operators to be in the business. Way back in the 70s, uh, Monopoly was taking over. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. I committed terrible faux pas in this uh, presentation. I put a lot of writing on my PowerPoint screens. Uh, this PowerPoint will be available. Um, We've got problems though. Forest tenure policy is a problem. It grants rights to public forests to private interests. 
Um, the AAC, the Allowable Annual Cut, rules the forest. So decisions are made on, based on volume considerations rather than ecological considerations. Professional reliance. Uh, so Mark Haddock's independent report found that the PR model leads to government managers seeing their primary duty as advocating or facilitating for industry. We see this happening in our watershed, unfortunately, and there's this culture of deference towards forestry professionals in the government, rather than a focus on serving the public interest. Let's start talking about the costs of this system. Some of you may have heard the term fall down effect. Um, it's the decline in timber production as the old growth is depleted and it's promoted as if it were a natural phenomenon when it is in fact a stunning admission that the forests have been drastically overcut every year since modern forestry was implemented in the 1940s. So that's a quote from a book by Marchek et al. from 1999. And in 1980, the chief forester was saying that old stockpile of old growth was a bonus. It was a gift from nature, but we won't have it the next time around. So we do have old growth in the boundary. We don't have um, the kind of old growth that you see on the coast. This is Stan and Wayne standing uh, next to some old growth. It, this is a cedar hemlock stand. And uh, this is a 250 to 300 year old tree. And that's the kind of old growth we get here. And it, as well as that high elevation, really skinny stuff, that's old growth. It takes a long time to get to that size in our watershed. Cost of the system, again, um, so we've got overcutting in the boundary. Way back even in 1998, boundary AAC allocated by the Ministry of Forests to 10 year holders was 25% higher than the ministry itself deemed to be physically sustainable. By ministry calculations, there was insufficient timber to sustain the level of logging being undertaken at that time. And the last boundary AAC determination actually predicts a fall down in timber supply. So um, a couple of forest inventory experts, um, Anthony Britniff and Martin Watts, looked into the forest inventory calculations for our watershed. And in a nutshell, they're saying that they're 20% too high. Uh, stand volume was overestimated by approximately 20%. So that means that um, the calculations that the AAC is based on is also wrong. And that means that logging over the past six to seven years may have been higher in our watershed than even what the BC government has determined as quote, sustainable. And this potential overcutting will continue at least until the next AAC determination in 2024 and maybe after that, unless the chief forester decides to make some changes. We are losing jobs. We've, it's happening across BC, it's been happening in the boundary. So again, that, that 1979 uh, rural study, uh, said there was approximately a thousand people employed by forestry in the boundary back in 1979, just in the western half of our watershed. And now the, the estimate for logging in, or for forestry jobs in our entire watershed is approximately 350 to 400 positions. Ecological consequences of clear cutting. Uh, most people here have probably heard of Suzanne Samard. Um, she and, and a group of other researchers quantified the losses as tree retention in logging operations declines from 100% retention down to 60 to 30 to 10 and way on down to 0%, which is essentially what a clear cut is. So with that decreasing tree retention, carbon stocks are decreasing. Regeneration and productivity is decreasing. Biodiversity is decreasing. Species diversity and richness decline, so including mosses and lichens, which are necessary for ungulate survival, and maybe Stan can talk a little bit about that later. We're losing the old growth we have in the boundary that the mosses and the lichens hang off of, and our ungulate numbers have gone way, way down. Last thing, fire risk goes up. Ding, 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 ding so important in this watershed. You may remember the Rock Creek fire from a few years ago. We are drying up and the more clear cutting there is, the drier we're gonna get. 
we have massive clear cuts in the boundary. This is a, a Google map of the northern part of our watershed. There are hundreds of clear cuts in the boundary that are over 100 hectares in size, even though the chief forester recommends a maximum 40 hectare size. Again, there's a problem. Industry is left to monitor itself. The chief forester is making recommendations. None of that is mandatory. Another problem is the side-by-side -side clear cut that are only separated by small strips of intact forest or a road. So you can see on this image, the gray or the brownish beige areas are clear cuts. And then there's some areas where there's lighter green. Those are clear cuts too. It's just that they've started to green up. And the medium green is older clear cuts as well. And from an ecological perspective, these become one big continuous clear cut. So the scale here, we've got two kilometers. There's huge clear cuts in our watershed. And slash piles build up, all this stuff gets cut down, not all of it gets used, a lot of it gets burnt. There's a picture of Stan standing next to a clear cut in our watershed, a uh, steep slope clear cut. This is the Dry Creek clear cut. It's over 454 hectares and two kilometers wide. This isn't the whole thing. This picture doesn't show the whole thing. And again, there's more of the Dry Creek clear cut. And you can see across the valley, there's more clear cuts as well. Uh, on our website, we've got an animated graphic that shows the clear cutting from 1965 to 2020. And this map here shows just how much of our watershed has been clear cut since 1971. And the parts that are still green those are parks. The rest of our watershed has been hammered. It's been hammered. And so this means that less, that means that this much of our watershed is 50 years old or younger. 50 years old or younger. <clears throat> More costs of the system, we can talk about monetary costs. Um, data indicates that the Grand Forks flood has cost at least $165 million and counting. And uh, you've probably seen the um, David Broadland article that shows that uh, BC forestry is costing us $1 million uh, a day. Um, I gotta, I'm going to fly through the rest of these costs. Um, hydrology, flooding, connection between forests, hydrology and flooding. There's enough studies that demonstrate that um, increases in clear-cut forestry cause increases in flooding, even a study that was done here in the boundary. Climate change predictions for the boundary are predicting increased flooding. And so we've got a lot of problems here. The intact forests that moderate the flow regime are disappearing. The old forests that do it best are disappearing. Uh, Clear-cut zones accumulate 30 to 40 percent more snowpack than intact forests, and snow melts 30 to 40 percent faster on clear cuts than in intact forests. Um, in our watershed, we've also had fires, so that's disturbance as well. That affects the hydrological regime, but measurements indicate that the amount of clear cutting far outweighs by like 10, at least 10 times, far outweighs the amount of fire disturbance that we have here. Forest roads are a big problem. We've got over 16,000 kilometers of forest roads in the boundary and more are being built. Here's an example. This is a grizzly bear area here and you can see all the roads that are going through those clear cuts. Uh, grizzly bears are going, yeah, thanks. Uh, how are we supposed to eat? We inspected um, 13 Forest Service roads in 2019. Uh, one of our members is a former forest ranger, and he found that all of these roads were inadequately maintained. They're damaged by industrial use. They've suffered years of neglect. And common problems include ditches and culverts being plugged, roads collecting water, lack of brushing, and bridge problems. Uh, here's a bridge problem at Arthur Creek. Um, the uh, force of the creek lifted the bridge here carried it one kilometer downstream. Big hydrological problems in our watershed. There are links between hydrological problems and forest roads, including soil erosion and surface erosion, bringing more sediment to water courses, soil compaction, increasing erosion and transport. The soil isn't infiltrating and hanging in the soil where the roads are being built. And so then we end up with problems like landslides. Uh, here's a 
West Boundary Creek landslide. It's a huge landslide. I don't know if you can tell from this picture. And looky, there's a clear cut at the top of that. Oops. More costs? Climate change predictions from the government indicate that extinction threat is likely to increase for species already in decline due to habitat loss, tree mortality is expected, increased drought, increased fire frequency. Ding, 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 ding. These threats make the protection of primary and old growth forests that capture and store water even more critical. We're going to talk a little bit about ECA and hopefully our hydrologists. I don't want to put them on the spot, but maybe you can talk a little bit about this. So from a layman's perspective, ECA, equivalent clear-cut area, means how much has been clear-cut. That's a real basic summary, and, and experts can talk a little bit more about this later. So experts say that the range of 30 to 40 percent ECA is the upper limit where negative hydrological impacts are likely to occur. This is a map of our watershed showing assessment units, those AWs, assessment units, little sub watersheds. And it's alarming that there are many of these assessment units with an ECA value over 40%, some over 50%. So what we're measuring here is we're measuring growth after a clear cut. So if it's 100% ECA, that means it's like a fresh clear cut. There's nothing there. If it's 0% ECA, that means that everything's grown back. We've got high ECA numbers, and that's having an impact on hydrology, flooding. So we're recommending that um, logging be paused in areas with an ECA higher than 25% until that ECA is at 15%. That's completely doable. The government of BC does not have to change any legislation to make that happen now. Big grizzly bears are negatively impacted by forestry roads. Uh, Brian Horacy, a biologist, did a great study back in the 90s. And this is a quote from his report. The human industrial endeavor that presents the greatest threat to bears and bear habitat is roads. Roads bring people to bear habitat with lethal consequences for bears. Mortality can be up to four times greater than for bears that avoid roads. Way back in the 90s, he was recommending that the area that he studied in the Granby have a, sh a short-term road de density limit object objective of 0.62 kilometers per kilometer squared. That was in the 90s. At 2012, the road density in the Granby Grizzly area was at 0.6 kilometers per kilometer squared, and more roads have been built since then. BC government promised a grizzly, grizzly bear management plan and in 2018, it committed to it and it still hasn't been created. This is a bear, a grizzly bear in our watershed, this picture. Um, in the regional district of Kootenai boundary, all these plants and animals um, are red and blue listed. That means they're either extirpated, endangered or threatened or of special concern. So what does that have to do with clear-cut logging? Well, clear-cut logging fragments habitat. Here's another overhead picture of our watershed. Huge amounts of clear-cuts. Grizzly bears are going, gee, thanks for leaving me so much room to find uh, habitat, to find food, um, to move, to reproduce. Industrial logging impairs the productivity of wildlife habitat. And this is a quote from a ministry, a ministry report. Extinction threat is likely to increase for species already in decline due to habitat loss as ecosystems change in response to climate change. So by programming, near total elimination of mature and old growth forests in the boundary, industrial clear-cut logging is facilitating the destruction of biodiversity. This must stop immediately. We have, like again, we have old growth. Here's another picture of old growth in the boundary and it's got those lovely layers layers of growth. There's, there's little bits of sunlight coming through. We've got that rich forest floor. And our old forests in the boundary have higher biodiversity values than mature stands and monocultural tree plantation. These old growth forests mitigate the effects of climate change. They provide critical habitat for species at risk and specialized species need old growth forests. Um, they offer resistance and resilience to climate change provide important ecological functions, 
hydrological functions. They provide potential for economic diversification for non-timber benefits. Traditional um, types of activities could happen if we maintained our old growth forests. And old growth is at dangerously low levels in the boundary. Details on that are in our, our report. Again, we've got here we've got some old growth. There's Roy standing looking at some uh, wildlife. We've got these big trees across the forest floor. They're breaking down. They're providing places for new seedlings to grow. They're uh, putting nutrients into the soil. We need this old growth. So again, let's go back to this map and remember how much of our watershed is 50 years old or younger. That's not old growth. In our watershed, old growth is categorized as at least 140 years old. We made some recommended actions in our report. I'm not going to go through these, but these are actions that the government can take without changing any legislation. They can be done immediately and they can make a significant difference. For us, for ecological integrity and for hydrological function as well, that ECA recommendation is highly important here. All right, not all doom and gloom. Let's talk about the new path forward. So our objectives for the boundary watershed are one, implement nature-based planning across the land base. So nature-based planning goes by different names. It could also be called ecosystem-based conservation planning. Um, Herb Hammond has written a few books on that subject. Number two, we want to manage the nature-based planning through community-based boards or committees comprised of local people. And these local people would be assisted by public se sector staff who are educated and informed in nature-based planning, in hydrology, natural sciences, biology, ecology, and ecoforestry. The goal of nature-based planning is to manage human activities in forests so that we can continue to receive their benefits without degrading the productivity and values of the natural forest. It's about working with nature's patterns and processes, not attempting to control nature. The top priority in nature-based planning is to protect and restore ecological integrity by keeping all the pieces, keeping all the pieces, and um, to maintain and where necessary, restore a forest natural ecosystem composition, structure, and function. When I, when I talk about natural here, I'm talking about industrial ecological condition. So prior to the simplification, homogenization, and degradation of ecosystems that occurred from clear-cut logging and um, resulted from tree plantations replacing natural forests. So we're proposing an alternative vision of forestry. Ecological forestry where we conceive of the forest as a home for nature and for humanity rather than a timber factory. So this picture is of a Creek in our watershed. And we've got lots of um, fallen trees across the creek. We've got biodiversity, we've got poplars, and we've got cedars, and we've got spruce growing in the same area. Leo, um, Aldo Leopold said, an intelligent tinkerer saves all of the parts. And unfortunately, in the current industrial paradigm, invaluable structure and components are being thrown away. In a natural forest ecosystem, like this one in this picture, there's no such thing as an unproductive forest. As long as there are, are live trees with green foliage, a forest will be productive. Um, so nature-based planning, it's not all woo-woo. Uh, there's ways of measuring and quantifying and setting goals and benchmarks. We can measure things that we're doing in nature-based planning. Um, so when we're doing nature-based planning, we're maintaining evolutionary and ecological processes, such as ecological functions, disturbance regimes like fire and insects, uh, photosynthesis, hydrological function, and nutrient cycling. We conserve biodiversity. We manage ecosystems to encourage social resiliency and economic resiliency. Again, it's not all woo-woo hippie shit, right? We're, we're concerned about uh, the economy. We're concerned about jobs. We're also concerned about the degree to which these systems can adapt. Can our social systems adapt if we use nature-based planning? Can our economy adapt? Well, we saw what happened when we were slammed by uh, COVID. 
in nature-based planning, we're using ecological constraints or limits for decision-making, again, rather than political timelines. We're managing ecosystems to maintain a mix of ecosystem goods, functions, and conditions. We're managing based on scientific knowledge and monitoring, learning, and continuously improving and replanning. So in the early 2000s, the government eliminated a whole lot of public se sector monitoring jobs. It eliminated um, local forest ranger stations and industry was left to monitor itself. And look, if you are a corporate executive and you're going to the AGM and you're speaking to your shareholders, you're not gonna walk in tomorrow and go look, we're shareholders, but we've decided we're gonna focus our efforts and our business and operations this year on the, the um, best interests of the people of Grand Forks, British Columbia. So profits, bad, we don't care anymore. The reality is that uh, no forest company executive is gonna do that. They have a particular mandate and their mandate is profits. So they're not gonna monitor themselves uh, for ecological integrity. They're gonna monitor themselves for uh, profits. Okay. So one of the processes involved in um, ecoforestry or nature-based planning is we do some groundwork, look at what's on the ground, and then we map out certain things. We map out ecologically sensitive areas, human use areas, areas to protect habitat zones, wildlife corridors, riparian zones, timber zones, areas to restore. We got a lot of restoration to do in our watershed, a lot of restoration. Ding, 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 there's some jobs. Uh, we also need to map out culturally significant areas. We've got um, different uh, indigenous groups that have historical territory here. We need to map out areas to log and not to log. But first and foremost, we choose where not to log. And once the planning indicates where logging can take place, ecoforestry is one of the methods used in, in nature-based planning. Okay, let's talk a little bit about selection logging. Um, I see quite often, I'm, I've gone over 40 minutes, but um, I'm coming to the end of the presentation here, so we'll get to questions soon. Um, I see on social media, I see that there's um, some confusion about the difference between select logging and selection logging, and Ray Travers has helped me to figure out the diff difference. So on the bottom of the screen in the small writing, uh, definition of selection logging. So <clears throat> selection logging has an objective, usually to improve the growth rate of individual trees, and recover tree mortality with intent to improve the overall vigor of the future forest. The future forest. We're concerned about the future forest with selection yeah. logging. Whereas selective logging is the unplanned partial logging of a forest to take the best trees and leave the worst trees with no thought for the productivity and values of the future forest. Yeah. Well. Right? So we're talking about selection logging. It has a purpose. We're not taking the best and leaving the worst. And an example of where they've been doing that for a long time, we refer to it in our report is um, the Menominee in, uh, in Wisconsin. They've been managing their forests for the future. So selection logging might, methods might retain um, live trees or of various sizes, ages, and species. Standing dead trees. So this picture is a wildlife tree. It's important. It's important to ecological integrity to maintain these kinds of trees. Uh, selection logging might maintain the large down trees, patches of trees, patches of habitat, um, forest patches to protect interior forest conditions. So what we're talking about is like when you have a patch of forest and you go deep into it, You've got cooler, shadier, moister conditions. We need to maintain forest patches that are large enough to maintain those interior forest conditions. Uh, we need to maintain habit, uh, el habitat elements like moss and lichen and mother trees. We need those. Okay, community forest boards. The, we're recommending community forest boards and they're a critical element of nature-based planning. And nature-based planning accepts that people are part of, not separate from, ecosystems. Nature-based planning provides for the development of diverse community-based sustainable economies, community-based economies. That's what we're looking for. 
That requires the direct involvement of local people in decision making. When local people are involved in decision making, they can adapt. They can adapt to local conditions. They can adapt. They can look at things and they can say, look, this isn't working. Let's change it. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's regroup and let's replan quickly with this, with this big centralized government. That doesn't happen. Uh, features of community forest boards. Uh, they will, they're comprised of local people who are impacted by decisions about their land base. They operate under the principles, goals, and objectives and standards of nature-based planning. Give undivided loyalty and unconditional allegiance to citizens, not to corporations. It would be legislated under provincial law, which would again clearly set out standards and principles which would be based in nature-based planning. There would be um, accountabilities, responsibilities, and forcibility would be guided and advised by independent science panels. We prioritize community-based economic development. There would have to be, a, there's a lot more to it. They would have to find methods for finding solutions when they're disagree, disagreeing parties. And they would depend on partnerships among governments, including indigenous governments, uh, land managers, the scientific community and stakeholders. I'm not going to go too much into this slide. We just wanted to make it clear in another presentation that there's a big difference between a typical community forest license and what we're promoting. Um, a lot of the community forest license in BC, they're doing clear cut logging and uh, they have to agree to AAC requirements that are dictated by the government. On the other hand, there is at least one, there may be more, I don't know of them. The Herat Proctor Community Forest is doing nature based planning. They're doing e eco-forestry. This is an example of the kind of thing that we're talking about. We have a value proposition, keep the land intact and the ecosystem functioning. They take their timber in smaller quantities. The timber is available over the long term. They use selection, forestry, and small patch cuts. And they have a mill there. They produce value-added flooring, paneling, and wood siding, and all of the jobs in the forest and um, the mill are filled by people who live close by. And they're creating through this system, they're creating more jobs for the same amount of wood that's being processed. So Harrop Proctor creates 3.4 jobs per thousand cubic meters of wood they process. Whereas the provincial average under the industrial clear cut forestry paradigm is creating less than one job per thousand cubic meters of wood processed. We've got employment being driven by a number of different factors in this new paradigm. We're allowing more small to medium sized operators access to public timber. That's gonna create jobs. It's gonna have a, a domino effect. Number two, it's gonna be an increase in the number of public and private sector jobs in planning, monitoring, and research. We've got to rebuild public sector jobs in planning, monitoring, and research. Those are essential. Three, we've got to decentralize forest management and that's going to create more jobs. Um, uh, employment will be driven by enabling a competitive open marketplace. Employment will be driven by maintaining a supply of quality wood that can be accessed by small businesses to manufacture value added wood products. So in our report, we talk about the Vernon log sort job, log sort yard. They were an example of a regional log sort mar market. It was highly successful. The government shut it down because it was a threat to big business. Um, it made a profit and employed people. It got more value out of the, the ugly logs. Like you, you may have heard lately, people are selling ugly carrots in the grocery stores. They're the ones that are bent. They don't, they're not the standard looking carrots. Uh, people still want to buy those standard, those non-standard carrots and people still will buy non-standard wood and use it and uh, make make money for our communities. Okay, um, how do all these pieces fit together? That's what this diagram is. It's in our report on our website. That's what this diagram is. Sorry, I realize it's probably very small on your screen, but you can access it on our in our report. So nature based planning is the key here and it's going to set the standards, principles and goals new legislation. And then the government is going to invest in community forest boards, 
expanding the research branch, expanding the public sector, value-added mills, regional log sort yards, and an open competitive market resulting in jobs, jobs, jobs. Community economies get revived. Uh, and at the same time, uh, raw log exports get reduced. Nature is rebounding. It allows uh, traditional uses to expand. And tourism, ecotourism can expand as well. We're proposing that the BC government install a pilot project in the Boundary Watershed that implements nature-based planning guided by a community forest board. Uh, we're ready. Get on it. Let's go. And in addition to that, we would like to see a new Forest Act created. There is a call for this across British Columbia. The new Forest Act must enshrine in law this new concept of sustainability it puts ecosystem integrity and resilience above all else. It must base forestry management on local administration, create open access to timber, provide undivided loyalty to the people of BC, and focus on local economic well-being. Right now, the, even the, the forestry corporations know that our system is not sustainable. And that's why uh, corporations are taking the profits that they get from BC forests and they're investing it in the USA. They're investing in mills in the US. Inter4 recently acquired a new mill in Georgia. Georgia, USA. So it's time to legally remove large corporate industry from the woods and have it do what it does best, which is manufacturing, not forestry. Thanks to Anthony Britton for that one. So finally, with climate change, the one thing for certain is that the future will not be like the past. And we must prioritize managing the condition of the forest so that it's more resistant and resilient to climate change. Natural ecosystems provide the benefits we need for survival. It makes sense to facilitate, maintain, and enhance the ability of nature to continue to do this. Members of the Boundary Forest Watershed Stewardship Society are citizens of BC, and we're telling the government in no uncertain terms what we want for our community's survival. Respectfully, we ask our readers and listeners to do the same, because what's at stake is too important to do anything else. Thank you. We're listening. All right. Um, I'm going to go through the chat right now and uh, get your questions. And if you have other questions and comments are welcome too. Like I said, I know there's a hydrologist out there. Please comment on ECA. And I know we've got a forest ecologist out there. Put your hand up. And uh, I'd love to hear your commentary on ecoforestry and ecosystems and our plan. I'm going to look through... Let's do it this way. I'll get all of our panelists to unmute yourselves. And I know that some of you would like to add your comments to what uh, I've just covered formally. And while you're doing that, I will look through the questions in the chat and we'll get to the questions in the chat next. So board members, chime in. How do I unmute myself? You are unmuted. <laughs> oh, I am? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Stan, I'd love to hear your comments about um, wildlife and what you're seeing with ungulates and uh, the mosses and the lichens. Okay. Uh, I've been here a long time. I've been here since 1960 and I'm a hunter, fisherman, a logger, uh, haywire and uh, so on and uh, I've seen and I used to hunt with hounds even right um, I've seen a lot of uh, changes in this uh, time and and it's been since probably 1980 85 in the mid 80s that I have start to see 
a reduction of wildlife. And I mean all wildlife. I mean birds, I mean ravens, I mean crows, I mean porcupines, I mean grouse, I mean bears, I mean mule deer. Um, yeah, all of those. And the, the worst ones are, in my opinion, porcupine. I haven't seen one for, and I spend two or three days a week in the forest, way up in the forest, because that's where I get peace and serenity. Anyway, uh, I haven't seen a porcupine here for 10, 10 years, maybe eight. Uh, our grouse population, you used to see cubbies every five miles of a half a dozen grouse pecking on the road for their grit. I don't see that anymore. I've, I've been in the forest, like uh, I, w I went up uh, here four days ago. I was up at, way up the Gr Granby. Never saw a chicken, not one. Uh, mule deer. Uh, you, I see the odd mule deer down in the valleys and eating with the cows and the horses, but I'm, I don't see them up in the higher elevations. And uh, the mule deer, in my opinion, is like 95% gone. There might be 5%, eight, 10, maybe at the outside remaining in, in this uh, watershed. And I'm talking about just the boundary watershed, uh, you know, and I hunt other places and I see the same thing happening. And uh, as far as I can see, uh, the mule deer have moved on simply because they're just like the caribou. They were, they're being starved out. Uh, the, the mule deer are actually eat close to what the caribou eat. You know, they eat the lankin and the moss too, off the rocks and uh, stuff like that. And once you clear cut that, that, that lankin, and that moss just dies from the burn, getting burnt up from the sun. So that's one of the main reasons, along with the wolf uh, population that we got due to the moose moving in here. And they moved in here because of the clear cuts and all the alder and willow that's growing uh, in these uh, clear cuts that haven't been planted or even were planted. So the moose moved in along the wolves behind them and uh, the wolves found that, hey, it's a hell of a lot easier to take down a, a, a mule deer than it is a, a moose. So they attacked them. And of course, the mule deer didn't have no experience with wolves, right? So there was no genetics in there for them to know how to survive against these things, right? So the they would just run them down to the point where they couldn't walk anymore and then eat them. So, and that's because of the clear cut. And that's one of the, there's so many bad things about the a clear cut that it's, you can sit here all day and, t and tell people about it. But uh, when you start losing wildlife, you're gonna start losing everything. And, and when you start losing everything, uh, you're not going to have any forest and you're not going to have any water because it's like the forest needs water and the water needs forest. And that's how it works. If you don't have any forest, it dries up. Uh, this, this particular spring here, we've had pretty dry weather and I've been irrigating my uh, two acre field uh, that I hay and uh, I couldn't believe I had to start uh, irrigating in April and pounding water to it. And then you, and for some reason, because of the climate change, we are having a wind uh, uh, in our uh, boundary country, especially around where I live here in the Grand Forks. We have wind all the time. We never used to have that kind of wind. And this wind, I, I look on uh, television for the Weather Channel and I see the, the percentage of humidity. 
in April, we were down, at one point we were down to 16% humidity and it didn't go up till, uh, to 30 until three, four weeks gone by every day. And along with that wind, no, no humidity and the wind. So I'm trying to irrigate my field and it's all evaporating into the, into the air because it's so dry. So I don't know how I got onto that subject, but I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> it's sorry. It's all connected, Stan. It's all connected. Thanks. Thanks well, for that well, information is, yeah. about wildlife. Yeah. So uh, we've got a question here. We've got two questions um, yeah. in the chat. So I'm going to read those out. Uh, thank you so much for the work you have done and continue to do. This is good. My question, what kind of response have you had so far on this report from any level of government decision makers? We haven't had a response. It's been sent to all levels of government and we haven't had a response. Um, I think we're going to have to um, set up some meetings with specific government people um, and create a call to action. We're going to have to be very specific with them and create a, a call to action that they can respond to. Because that's what we need. <laughs> we need a response from government here. We'd like to work with government. I have a quick question. This is Roy speaking. Is there any one of the attendees from the ministry and or industry on this webinar? If so, could you please introduce yourselves? Uh, you can raise your hand. I see that Roly Russell is here. He's on the call and he's our MLA. And um, Dana O'Donnell said she, I'm just looking through the names here. Uh, Dan O'Donnell, who's our um, RDK director, said she was going to sign on, but I don't know if she made it. I don't see, see any other hands raised. Okay. So um, the next question. I work in the climate change policy realm, and I was wondering if the new BC forest carbon offset protocol is being considered as a way to implement nature-based planning in forestry projects, or sorry, to implement nature-based planning forestry projects. Would creating an offset project for community forests in the boundary forest be a feasible option to help fund the new paradigm of forestry that the report outlines? If you made that comment, can you put up your hand? Because I think I don't have an answer to that question. Does anybody else on our panel have an answer to that question? I don't know enough about that topic. Okay, let's see. Alexandra? Alexandra, can you unmute yourself? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, great, thank you for that question. So is, do you, how do you see those two things working together? What, what are your ideas for that? So uh, the BC government had a previous uh, forest offset protocol that was taken away but they're working on a new one currently and there's one example that I've heard of is the the Shikamus community forest in the Whistler area and I think I see some similarities there they're using they call it ecosystem based management for the forestry that they're doing and they use the offset protocol to quantify the carbon sequestered due to this better management of the forest um, and can create credits, um, which leads to funds to help uh, make it more feasible to have these projects that aren't as profitable, but um, as you've discussed, are much more sustainable. Excellent, thank you for that. And that would be a great angle for us to pursue as well as other communities who are interested in doing the same thing. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have another. Does anybody on our panel have anything to add about to Alexandra's comment there? Definitely something I need to um, look into and get more education on. And um, we'll look into that. So another question, what are insect outbreak conditions like as far as Douglas fir beetle in the area in general and post fire areas specifically? And 
WRT to mature stands. I'm not sure if that was a typo or if WRT stands for something I'm not familiar with. So insect outbreak conditions like in the and Douglas fir beetle, um, Stan or Roy or Ray, do you want to, uh, Ray Hansen, do you want to answer that? You guys know more about that. I don't, I don't have uh, up-to-date information on, uh, on surveys with regard to those uh, pests, but uh, I know they certainly exist in the, in the uh, watershed. And uh, I think there's trapping going on and, and different uh, survey methods to determine how bad they are and where they are and what needs to be done about them. Yeah, yeah, hey, you're right, uh, Ray. There, there are uh, uh, traps, uh, fur, fur beetle traps out there. Uh, I've, I've seen them all over the place, actually, in most of the watersheds. And I also, I have seen a lot of uh, mortality on the old fur. Now, I, I had got a hold of a scientist at UBC and uh, uh, Dave Matow, I think is his name, and uh, I sent uh, an email asking him, you know, what's happening. And then I said, he got in touch with me, and I I took a bunch of pictures of the fur in in uh, different stages of declining, you know, uh, yellow attack, red attack, you know, dead, and uh, he 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 came back with the fact he says it's probably uh, uh, a, a, a variety of things it's the climate change it's the droughts uh, so all these trees are getting uh, stressed to the point where they're not healthy enough in order to fight off some of these uh, insects so yeah okay thank you thank you for that okay so I'm not sure if it's just me not being able to tell from the, know the technical details here, but I can't tell who's making these comments, but um, somebody commented that it seems somewhat that chica moose have a problem. Only older 70 to 100 year old trees can be used for carbon offset. So we definitely need to look in that into that. And then someone else commented, carbon offsets are not dealing with the problem, just postponing the inevitable. Offsets are about continuing to endorse the burning of fossil fuels by supporting projects that sequester and store carbon. However, they confuse fossil carbon with ephemeral carbon sequestered and stored in forests. If it were not for our use of fossil fuels, this carbon would never be released to the atmosphere. Simply put, carbon offsets are a dangerous diversion from what we need to do protect primary and old growth forests and stop the use of fossil fuels. And I'm not sure if this is the same person, but- um, That was from her, Pam and Jennifer. Oh, okay, I'm glad you can see that. Okay, and this next one for proper forest carbon accounting, is that from Herb as well? It's from Doug Cook, Douglas okay. Cook. Okay, so Douglas says, for proper forest carbon accounting, we first have to get rid of mass Massive corporate ecocide subsidy exempts the carbon emissions role that current corporate industrial ah, my, the message just popped out. Corporate industrial fiber mining plays in the climate crisis. So, um, Herb, are you okay to uh, to talk a little bit uh, about those carbon offsets and and the things we need to prioritize? If you are, you can raise your hand, and I will. Um, open this up so that we can hear from you because I'd, I'd be really interested to hear more about that. If I don't see your hand raised, I'll know that you just, you're just, uh, oh, there we go. Well, I think, I think the message really kind of says it all. Uh, the, the carbon offsets are also plagued by the, the fact of, that you have to quantify how much carbon is actually being sequestered and stored in a carbon offset project. Uh, that has proven to be a, a lucrative market for a lot of, uh, of consultants that largely are an employee of industry. Uh, and so that gets inflated. And, and so we end up with inflated carbon offsets 
that uh, are used by companies to continue to justify uh, pollution with fossil fuels. And that, that has plagued every one of those kinds of programs. People who talk about it as an interim solution to, to what we, we need to do, ignore the fact <clears throat> that it, it keeps the level of fossil fuels being burned uh, at the current level. And, and that current level isn't staying static or being reduced, it's growing. So that means you have to keep growing carbon offsets. So it's, it's a little bit like the problems with, with uh, net zero in 2050. Uh, we, we keep avoiding uh, the, the real things that we need to do. A and carbon offsets are just another example of that. Uh, I, I think that it's dangerous to, to try to tie uh, good forest uh, protection and use to a program like that because it's, it drags down the integrity of what you're trying to do. Uh, and and, and I, don't think, uh, I don't think that's advisable. It, it's the, the, real, the real point about forests from an ecological standpoint has uh, been well uh, documented by people like William Muma, who is a, a, a retired climate scientist along with a lot of other forest ecologists who basically say we need to stop cutting forests, period. Uh, and that he advocates uh, for a process called proforestation, which means letting forests grow till their, their natural uh, age is reached and they start dying and diversifying. And, and that's what happened before we uh, developed the practice of forestry which is really no more than an, an industrial definition of how to turn trees into dollars. And you can do that, uh, you can do that uh, more or less uh, carefully. And I've been involved in doing that for many decades, uh, but the reality is still there that it's not a natural uh, or really ecologically supported use of forests. So uh, plus we've got plenty, if we wanna talk about carbon offsets, We've got plenty of wood out there in our landfills that's being turned into methane that we could have recycled uh, to use to build houses to meet our wood needs. Uh, we were involved in that uh, 30 years ago as uh, in the early days of uh, forest certification. And in our certification program, uh, the first choice was recycled wood, not, not uh, wood cut from forests. So anyway, that's digressed a little bit down the path from, uh, from carbon offsets, but uh, that's, that's the problem there. And it's, it's, easy, it's easy to get fooled by uh, the, those, those ideas. I, I understand why people are drawn in uh, to them without thinking that through carefully. Okay, thank you so much, Herb, for that information. I, I really appreciate that you added that comment. Is there anyone on our panel who wants to add to that about carbon offsets? Well, the, what I know about carbon, this is Stan again. Um, maybe I better shut up. Uh, no, I, uh, when, when we clear cut that forest, there, in the forest, there's sometimes up to six inches of duff. This duff, when you scrape it off, along with the huckleberries and the uh, snowberries and everything else, uh, when you scrape it off with the limbs and the logs that you skid, immediately what comes out of that, you bear, a, bear the ground up and it's the carbon heading into the sky it just doubles and triples and so forth. And there's nothing to catch it because you cut it all down around there, right? So that's a, that's a big problem. And because of that, the huckleberries aren't grown. Uh, so there's no food for the bears. A lot of them are going into their dens uh, uh, pretty hungry. And a lot of them don't make it through. Yeah. Thank you, Stan. Um, OK, so um, we've got Four more questions here, four more questions and comments. 
Uh, this one is Rosie from the Kootenays. Um, she says, I do, uh, I do Douglas for poor Beetle trapping in the Kootenays for a contract with the ministry. There's a different contractor in the boundary. I'll try and get some maps, trap site positions, and would love to visit and just do a general assessment of the area. Thank you so much, Rosie. That, that would be much appreciated. You can con contact us at um, boundaryforest at gmail.org. Boundaryforest at gmail.org. Sorry, gmail.com. Gmail.com. I'll put that in the comments. Boundaryforest at gmail.com. Another comment, and I'm sorry, I can't tell who it's from. The recommendations are well thought through and the presentation was excellent. The big question is, how do we get there from here? And within the necessary time frame? For instance, the next date for the determination of the allowable annual cut is 2024. What other decision times present themselves? Or is more drastic action such as blockades by forest activists here on Vancouver Island going to be necessary? Heck yeah. I uh, really, I mean, after talking with people across British Columbia, including people who've been in the ministry, um, uh, people like Ray Travers, who've, who've been at this game for a long time. Uh, Ray Hansen's also been with the ministry uh, in the past. Um, listening to people like Bob Williams, who's the former, um, the former minister of forests. We have to change the political will in our, like, any little bits of tinkering around with the current forest legislation is not going to get us anywhere. It's just more talk and log. You know, it's what Horgan is doing right now with uh, so-called deferrals is he's just kicking the can down the road and he's essentially not doing anything. A lot of the areas that are supposedly being deferred weren't going to get logged for various reasons anyways. And uh, so if they start tinkering around with FERPA and the current forestry legislation, it's just, it's just, in essence, it's them kicking the can down the road. So we've got to change the political will. We've got to find somebody in the current political system who's willing to support our pilot project. That, that has to happen. We have to have support from local government. We've got to have that key person in our local government, either the RDKB or the city of Grand Forks or our MLA who will stand up and fight for this and make this a priority. And it should be a priority. This absolutely, after the devastating flood of 2018, the, addressing the forestry issues in our watershed is the priority. And so we need that key person in the ministry to help us with that. We need that key person in the local government to help us with that. We could also use help from um, Indigenous people, Indigenous governments, and, and that's on us to reach out to them. Uh, or if any of you are listening, please reach out to us. Uh, we need to work together to do this. And, and that is the key question. How do we get there from here? Well, <laughs> our, our little intrepid band of, of folks, we, we emerged out of a flood and we've gotten this far. We managed to get some funding so uh, we can get some more funding and we can carry on. It just takes a few people to make something like this happen. Um, the other part of your question is more drastic actions such as blockades by forest activists going to be necessary? Hell yes. This should be happening across British Columbia and people across British Columbia I'm seeing are just thirsty. They're, they're hungry for action. They want to see something done. Um, they don't know how to get involved themselves. Blockades are a one way to get involved. There's lots of different ways to uh, create forestry reform in BC. They're all important. Local projects like ours are important. There's letter writing, there's petitions, there's blockades. There's um, the NGOs and the work that they do. Somebody's gonna come up with some magical creative thing too. Some young folks are gonna come up with that. But our lo local projects like ours, we need political support. Um, I, you know, we'd love to have a blockade here in the boundary. There's lots of spots like Sand Creek is being, ha is a, sorry, there's plans to hammer Sand Creek in an ugly way. Um, we need to address that. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm going to go through a couple more questions and if anybody else would like to chime in with ideas for how do we get there from here, those are most welcome. Okay, uh, next question. Hi folks. Yes, I'm here, although unfortunately I had to miss a bunch of the session for another meeting. I'm, I'd be happy to set up a time to talk more. 
Joanne, can you tell me whose comment this is? This is Rolly Russell. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, the engagement around the intentions paper for our forest management has the potential to be valuable for some of these conversations as well. Anyway, I'd be keen to plan for a group conversation in the week's head for whomever is interested. The legislature just got called back in session, so he has to go now. So Rolly Russell, he's our MLA. Okay, um, Joanne, who's this next comment from? Along with this report, is there any particular resource you would recommend for a community that would start working toward a community forest board? Mm, sorry, it'll just take me a sec. Um, it's, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so resources for starting a community forest board, I'm, I don't know of any specifically, but that's a really good question. Um, I, I can go through, or you can go through our report too. I might have some references sure. in that section. Oh. It's from Shakti. Okay, thanks. So Harrop Proctor is actually, a, it's a community forest license, which is different from the community forest boards that we're talking about. So anybody who's interested in a community forest license would, um, would apply to the government. Oh, I got two hands up. I got Herb and I got Douglas. Um, I'm going to go to Douglas first, and then we'll go to Herb. Uh, well, thanks for uh, uh, giving me the chance. I'm not sure if I push the uh, hand button, but I do have some suggestions with regards to this. And that is, you know, as a community who has gone through the kind of, you know, hydrological uh, crisis, and you know forest related uh, crises that that you have and many others around the province um, you know in my mind it's uh, it's 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 a perfect opportunity for the community to just start this whole process themselves which you already have done this report is a fantastic uh, uh, achievement in in doing that but then just go further start calling your community together fully open, just members of your community. And, you know, if there's representatives from corporations who are based elsewhere, who are headquartered elsewhere, you know, they can come and participate, but then they shouldn't be, uh, you know, the ones that uh, are contributing to making the decision. It's just the community that really needs to start this process of community consensus democracy. And there's all kinds of models for that. Um, around, uh, you know, the city repair movement in Portland, Oregon is an example of that where neighborhood by neighborhood, those communities have gotten together and just done things on their own, regardless of, uh, of being ignored by the municipality or the city or the state or the federal government. If they want a, uh, a um, bus shelter in their neighborhood, they just build it. They don't worry about it, you know, and if, as long as it's a decided for by all the members in that community, they just build it. They don't wait for Jimmy Patterson or some deal from, you know, uh, the city or the, the state. So uh, what I'm suggesting is just start that process, start developing on your own. And that's going to give you this kind of strength and momentum and uh, and, you know, time dynamic to uh, do the job the good job like you already are doing. Excellent, thanks for that. Those are great suggestions, Doug. Um, Herb, your hand was up, you're on. I, I actually didn't know my hand was up, okay. but, but I, I'll, I'll add a couple of things here. One, um, the, the book that I wrote in 1991, Seeing the Forest Among the Trees, uh, the, the Case for Holistic Forest Use, has a, a section in it about community forest boards. Uh, not not to be confused with, as you pointed out, community forest agreements uh, like uh, the province has uh, has set up. But I think uh, when uh, I, I read that still uh, 30 years hence, uh, it's still just as valid uh, now as it was when it was written. And I think it, it outlines a structure that uh, can be easily applied in, in government legislation if we wanted to set it up. But let, let me also just in, endorse uh, or support what, what Doug said. I think that in two simple words, uh, the path for, forward for you and, and communities everywhere is do it. 
Uh, and you, it's not hard to make plans that are better than industrial plans or non-existent government plans. Uh, and and I, I think the more uh, that you can both educate the public, but also prepare your own vision and plan for what needs to happen and assert that, uh, sometimes that will mean feet on the ground, uh, like we see in Ferry Creek and elsewhere. Uh, but that can be done in different ways and in, in dignified ways that communicate the, the point. Uh, the probably the biggest single political thing that we all need to get behind is to, to abolish the forest tenure system. It was, if, if, that, doesn't, if that continues to be uh, in place the way it is today, which by the way, the current government intention paper does nothing to change that, uh, they're going to, to move it around uh, so and, uh, call and make reconciliation with indigenous people, the industrial school of forestry. Uh, so it, it's, the, 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 it's not moving in the right direction either. But we all need to have that as at least a postscript to everything we say. Uh, and people need to understand why that is so critical because right now it, it shapes everything from education and research to government policy uh, to what people consider as good forestry. Yeah. Thank you so much, Herb. Um, one of our board members has to go and he just has a quick question. And uh, then there's, uh, I see Martin Hewn has his hand up and we've got five more comments. So the question quickly to ask um, both Ray Travers, and then we'll ask Herb Hammond too. Have you uh, reviewed the intention, the government intentions report that Roly was talking about, Ray Travers? Thank you very much uh, for your your, your question. Uh, I, I wish that uh, uh, put it this way, uh, I was a little younger than what I am uh, because uh, I, uh, 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 how should I put it? Uh, I've had some challenges, health challenges recently, and I've been very, very difficult uh, for me to, to, to uh, uh, basically to communicate the way that I guess I would like to. Uh, but uh, what I would just like to comment on is that I, I, I like the comments that I've heard from the community very much. Uh, I think if, if we put our hope in some kind of uh, guru to appear out of nowhere to lead us out of this wilderness, uh, I think we'll be waiting a long time. I think what we have to do is uh, do a much better job of uh, trusting our intuition and our common sense, and then uh, being uh, equally rigorous uh, in, in terms of how we, uh, how we test uh, uh, the, uh, the proposals that are coming our way. Uh, what I see happening are uh, some uh, papers, you know, like this intentions paper and so on, uh, that uh, we've got to get the fundamentals right. You know, we, we've got to get the, it's got to be credible. It, it, it's it's got to be, uh, 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 you know, uh, we, we have to be able to, to test the, uh, 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 the uh, you know the the, the assumptions uh, in, in in a in a in a in a rigorous way uh, more uh, and and not be sidetracked by uh, uh, by things like this intentions paper. Uh, I, I'm just quite frankly sick about what I saw there. Uh, I just saw you know as they say deja vu all over again. You know we've been there before, yeah. and I think a, a council. Of, of very uh, talented people uh, would be uh, uh, a good place to start, a good place to bring together people uh, that uh, uh, have, have watched this system for, for decades continue to go downhill. Uh, now, it does get tricky, you know, when we have things like uh, lumber prices going to, you know, orders of magnitude higher than, than what we've ever seen before. And that, that's an enormous distraction in terms of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, what uh, uh, we really need to be thinking about. And the last time I looked, 
uh, you know, the, 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 that short-term sp spike in, 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 uh, in uh, 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 timber values is, is, uh, is, is going to crash as, as quickly as, as it arrived. And I think we've got to be prepared uh, to, to really uh, 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 be prepared to, to, to challenge uh, 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 all of our assumptions about uh, what works and what doesn't work and how we can uh, uh, invite uh, people in with, who, who uh, sadly watched the decline here for, for many times. I know I'm starting to ramble here, but uh, at any rate, well done. Uh, I, I, uh, I uh, hope to be back feeling better um, uh, without getting too medical about my situation. Uh, I am going uh, back into Royal Jubilee in about 10 days time. And the whole idea there uh, is to get my uh, 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 body and brain uh, functioning like they used to be and, and not so slow in terms of uh, being able to talk. But I'm delighted to be part of this conversation nonetheless. So have a good day. Thank you so much, Ray, and, and best wishes for your hospital visit there. Um, we're going to go to Herb in a minute about the intentions paper, but before, and we'll carry on for everyone who can stay, uh, but before people start to leave, we were officially due to end at 1.30, but we'll carry on here. Um, I just wanted to mention to everybody that, uh, yeah, we could use your help. Um, you can become a member of the Boundary Forest Watershed Stewardship Society. Uh, your membership fee will help us out. Uh, you can also make donations to us and, and that kind of money really helps because there's a lot of little groups like ours that are, it's run by volunteers and, and we get, we get, um, we get maxed out and then we can, we can only go so far, you know, Douglas's suggestion for us bringing our community together is a great idea, but then who's the us, right? Like it's, my life has been completely disrupted by the flood and I'm just trying to scramble to, to put it back together. Um, I haven't been able to make a living. And so um, my ability to continue to do this full time is, is maxed out. And so, yeah, we could use some help financially. And um, if we can, if we get financial help and we get grants, then, then that helps us a lot. And we can do things like start to pull our community together. Um, so you can go on our website at boundaryforest.org and uh, you can uh, make a donation and that will help us out a lot. And hopefully this, this thing that we're doing will be a model and an example that other communities can jump on board with as well for their own communities. Um, okay, so Herb, over to you. Have you reviewed the intentions paper and your thoughts on that? I have reviewed the in intentions paper uh, and I... I agree fully with what Ray said, and Ray, I wish you well. I hope uh, the days coming are are better. The, Thank you. The, the uh, I I uh, I think that you can summarize it in in a few uh, points. First of all, it's about keeping the cut up, uh, and the and the way you keep the cut up is in, in the eyes of this intention paper is to uh, to to uh, give the appearance of taking it away from industry, uh, but all it's doing is taking it away from industry and redistributing it to uh, community forest agreements that will be uh, will have volumes tied to them uh, and requirements tied to them, a and it will it's a way uh, that in that respect to get access to socially inaccessible timber. Uh, and it, because it divides and conquers community. Uh, more perverse is, uh, in my view, as a non-Indigenous person, is the way it treats alleged reconciliation because it, it intends to do the same thing uh, with elected band councils, which are not the traditional governments uh, of, of, for, uh, of Indigenous nations, nor are they charged with uh, administering their laws outside of small reserves, but they they will be uh, offered uh, part of this divided pie uh, as uh, under the rubric of reconciliation, and which also is an insult to to the indigenous nations and another divide and conquer move. 
So it's quite, it's, it's quite a, it's a smooth, clever kind of way of doing things. Uh, That'll be a uh, uh, standpoint, but uh, not, not a, not a reasonable uh, place to go. So it's, uh, I mean, we, we need to get back to the fact that we gave public forests away to private timber interests in the, the 40s and 50s. Uh, we did that to allegedly uh, the government of the day to build communities uh, in the outback. Uh, and, and to some degree that worked. Uh, they're still pretty questionable whether it really worked very well at all. Uh, but uh, I think gave is the key word. And now those companies trade them back and forth with each other for millions of dollars. That's our land that they're selling back and forth to each other. So if the government wants to do something progressive in forestry, they cancel tenure for the same, uh, for the same reasons they once set it up for the social uh, and ecological and economic good of the province. Uh, and they manage it through systems like you outlined uh, of community forest boards that are accountable to nature-based plans and are, uh, are accountable to an over, uh, overarching public agency. So uh, and until we get to that, that place, uh, we're just putting Band-Aids on, on a festering wound. And in many cases, uh, those, those Band-Aids are, are insults to, to communities and indigenous nations. Yeah, it's also an insult to the forest. Yeah. Uh, Herb, you're quite right when you say we have to get 10 years and we have to do that. We can even do that as private people. And another thing that we have to do is we have to get rid of Section 16 authorization. That thing is, is just wild. It permits them to go anywhere and anything. And uh, it, it's above water and it's above humans, right? Yeah, so we need, we, I'm a firm believer that we need a new forest act. We need to chuck it, turn the whole thing on its head and start over because we've got to get back to these fundamentals that Ray Travers was <clears throat> mentioning and, and her uh, when you when you speak about these issues, you're talking about the fundamental issues, and the intentions paper isn't addressing that thing, that sort of thing. Uh, right now, it doesn't appear that anyone in the provincial government is addressing the fundamental issues. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Um, so, Martin Hewn, you had your hand up uh, for a while there. Um, do you have a comment or a question? Um, comments, I think, and maybe questions as well. Uh, I try to keep them to a minimum because I know that if you ever try to do anything good, a lot of uh, evil comes your way. So a <laughs> uh, couple things here. In the discussion, what I've heard is that there's certain issues regarding wildlife, there's certain issues regarding wildfires, flooding, and so on and so forth. Is the group uh, involved with any liaisons with like B Wildfire BC or local fire departments to sort of get their twist on, on what's going on there, as well as with uh, Conservation Officer Service? Uh, issues that come up that I've noticed are things like people, you know, getting tickets for attracting bears into the community when it's actually uh, logging operations that are scaring them out of the mountains. I'm, I'm in Greenwood, so this has sort of been a, a, a current uh, comment or, or conversation that's going on. Uh, the machinery does scare the animals and uh, they look, they keep going until they find something. And of course, then uh, we people get kind of blamed for attracting attractants as the word is used. Uh, so I'm just wondering if there is interaction between the, the organization here and with uh, conserv uh, conservation officers and with, uh, with fire departments. Not so, not, we haven't contacted fire departments yet. We're not, we're not at that point. And, and again, like the problem is we're limited. Like we have a limited number of people on the board, limited number of volunteers. So Martin, if you're in Greenwood, you would love, you're welcome to join us. If those ideas sound really good. Um, and uh, I'm on the, I, I am on the fire department here. Uh, I don't speak for the fire department, but I, you know, I, I sort of look at what's going on around and, and it's pretty important and pretty critical that we do have some 
you know, more, the more knowledge we have of what's going on is good. So it's always good to just sort of keep an eye on who is actually listening and uh, interested in, in that sort of thing. So uh, that, that's what the point I want to make. And if there's anyone that does have, um, you know, any, any interests of that area, you know, I'm always available. You know, Thank you, you know so much. We, Thank you, Martin. Uh, that's really great. We did address, um, one of the uh, areas that was supposedly being cut for fire smarting near Greenwood. And we, we do have some, we do take issue with some of the things that were done um, that actually seem to be, rather than reducing the amount of fire that's gonna run through there, um, it would actually increase the fire. So uh, we, we should talk about that for sure. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, mm -hmm. I'm yeah. just gonna go through I'm going to right. go through some uh, comments here because uh, people are probably getting ready to leave. Um, uh, one of the comments here uh, says, agree, Ray Travers, been there, done that since at least the 90s. Government changes and dismantles any progress every few years. And your has to go, like Herb says, been saying it forever. Another comment, I'm more, more hopeful now than I was before noon today. Thank you. <laughs> That's great to hear. We can all work on this together. And then there's a um, couple of questions here. Uh, Rosanna, uh, she says, I'm a forest entomologist, plant health specialist, and forest ecologist from the Kootenays, and I've worked lots in the boundary, and it is heartbreaking on the ground. I am on a small local watershed society in Weimar. Thank you for all that you're doing and great presentation. Would love to ally closer with your society in the future. We'll PM with my contact info. Fabulous, Rosanna. Um, Douglas Gook said in Alexandra Morton's new book, Not On My Watch, she documents the 35 years of struggle to get toxic fish farms out of our wild sacred salmon's ocean. Almost nothing worked until First Nations and broader community started to occupy the farms. Will the good people of the Boundary Region take up this challenge? I will volunteer to help. Thank you, Douglas. Yeah. Power to the people. Hey, uh, from an anonymous comment, um, your plan is consistent with a community economic development approach with pillars in the ecology, economy, and community, as well as infrastructure. Through this lens, you may be able to widen your support. Beautiful. Um, another question. Have you presented this to the council meeting at City of Grand Forks? A motion to support this would be helpful. Thank you for that suggestion. We need to book our presentation to the city of Grand Forks. Uh, we'll be doing that. Uh, Diana asks, will this recording be publicly available? Thanks all, great presentation. Yes, Diana, we are going to make this a recording publicly available. Thank you. Now, I'm just gonna go through um, if there's any other comments or questions. Uh, Martin, I see your email there, thank you. Okay, um, any other, just to wrap it up, any of our panelists want to make a final comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, having worked in the Boundary Forest District for 14 years at a management level prior to 2000, I always felt that we had one of the best timber supply areas in the Southern Interior and it could easily supply all the products that the forest can 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 provide until things were changed in the early 2000s and no accountability was left for making sure that things were done ecologically and sustainably and so things have declined to the point where everything's in danger now <clears throat> For instance, McCray Creek, a, trib a large tributary of Christina Lake, was a, a spawning channel for kokanee. And there was a natural slide there that blocked the mouth of the creek so the kokanee couldn't get up there. And so the creek was cleaned out at at government expense so that the kokanee had access. Now, the forest industry is going to log McRae Creek 
and it's a very steep side hill type valley. If you drive from Christina Lake to Castlegar, as you come up the big hill, you'll see you're right beside McRae Creek. And there's lots of logging blocks that are going to be logged there and probably all clear cut. Now the ECA of that area before it causes a catastrophic failure into Christina Lake is a real, a real challenge to consider. If that creek lets go again, or the sidewalls of that valley let go again, it will mean all the work done to provide access for the kokanee into that drainage will be destroyed and who knows how bad it will be uh, for the areas alongside the creek and perhaps residences as well. So that's the kind of problem that we're up against in the future unless we start to make some changes to recognize the topography and the ecology above the financial benefits. That's my thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for bringing your experience, Ray. Really important issues that you just brought up. Roy, you had some final comments. Roy is the president of our, our society. Yes, I wanted to first of all thank Jennifer and all those that attended this webinar today. It's good to see people are recognizing um, the problems that we have. And I think Ray kind of just, not kind of, he touched upon what's what the problem is. And my earlier question was whether there was anyone from government or industry attending this webinar. And Roly Russell did uh, chime in on that. However, it shows that the, the people that could make the changes are not listening and they're, 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 they're not involved and they're carrying on business as usual. And the question of how do you, how do you make the change? How do you to, to stir the pot, so to speak, is, I guess is evident in, that, in how the Ferry Creek standoff um, was conducted. And I think that's probably the route we have to take. We have to engage more people so that they're aware of what's happening. Ray and myself are going to be looking up at a, a, a drainage just above where I live, which was is so degraded, the ECAs have to be well over 50%, and yet they continue to develop. And it seems as though there's no one to really stop them. And that's where the public is going to have to become more involved. And then there has to be a greater push on those leaders and the industry to recognize that people are no longer satisfied with the status quo. So again, thanks for everyone who's attended this meeting. Thanks, Roy. And Dan, did you have a final comment? Well, um, yes. And, and, like uh, Roy said, it's probably about 60% uh, ECA. And uh, the, the reason they're able to do that is because of Section 16 authorization, because uh, the volume of wood is more important than water or humans. That's yeah. why I'm saying that that rule has to be blown off the map. Yep. Thank you for pointing that one out, Stan. All right. Thank you to everyone who attended today. Thank you to our panelists. This uh, recording will be made available sometime over the next couple of days. You will receive an email with the recording and uh, it will be also on our website so it can be shared publicly. Uh, good luck to everyone in your own communities. Uh, please join us if you can. Uh, we appreciate your support in any way that you can give us support and uh, power to the people. Hey, Jennifer, Bye. Jenny, is uh, did uh, um, um, Wayne Tiblis get on? Is he on today? Yeah, he wasn't able to make it. I'll talk. I'll talk to you on the phone, Stan. Yeah. Okay. Take care, everybody. Okay. Bye. Thanks.